Do you think developers are giving up way too much control for the potential benefits of an easier life? The end user doesn't care whether your website is made with React or Angular or Webpack or Broccoli or Grunt or whatever. They just want it to work in their damn browser. So you're like one of the masters of browser standards, uh, as in you've been involved in the challenges for quite some time. And it does feel like we're going through a cycle of this one browser to rule them all. Uh, like I remember back in the days of IE6, mm -hmm. uh, and it does feel that we're, there are challenges, especially like WebKit browsers. I agree that we go around in cycles. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, I know you won't believe it, but I'm old enough to remember the glory days when Netscape ruled the world. Then it was IE6, like you said, then Firefox, then what was next? Then it was uh, Safari, then Chrome. People tend to assume that their customers or their users are all like them. Um, but you have to get out of that mindset. And it's really injurious to the health of the web if people just code for one browser. We saw it in Opera when we had to start implementing WebKit-only features just because, although they worked in Opera, if you use the O prefix, people didn't because they were, oh, this is for iPhone only. So we ended up having to implement other people's vendor prefixes, which just screwed up the standards for everybody. And I think even that Microsoft does that now too, because when they had the Windows Mobile browser, they got caught with the WebKit-only stuff too. It's bad, but uh, unfortunately, people seem to think that there's only one browser out there, and it's yours. Yeah, we see that a lot. I mean, only works best in, in whatever. And I always find that's quite damaging, because that's not the only browser. Um, especially, it does feel like very Western-centric, like there's a whole world out there that's not based on. Um, how can we get developers to start thinking about that? Like, to sort of shake up the, in not necessarily shake up the, but shake up the developers, say, look, you're, unless your product is only specifically for your neighborhood, you need to be considering these things. I mean, is, is it the responsibility on the developer? Is it a tool chain thing where you actually start making sure that the tools or even the browser say, look, this is not going to work in other browsers? That would be good if the Chrome Dev tool said, you know, PS, this isn't going to work in Firefox or something like that. But I think it's, it's a matter of just having a broader perspective. I mean, <clears throat> even making things that are only for your neighborhood, you never know where your customers are. Um, when I was doing talks about the wealthy Western web, I used to use the, uh, the example of a site called, um, it was called Stepping Out, I think, and it was a dating site in New York for conservative Jewish families where one-on-one -on -one dates weren't appropriate. So it would be like 10 Jewish guys and 10 Jewish women would go out for a kind of a group date. And they didn't really uh, get critical mass, these guys, and they were going to turn off the servers. And they noticed they were getting loads and loads of sign-ups from India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, oh, yeah. because this group dating model worked equally well for conservative Hindu, Muslim, or Sikh families. Yeah. And they ended up getting more sign-ups from subcontinent than they'd ever got in New York. And then they moved to Mumbai and rebranded as Stepping Out and became India's biggest dating site, even though the three guys had never left New York before that. I mean, yeah, if you're making a website for a neighborhood pizza joint, you're probably not expecting much custom from India or Nigeria. But really, you never, ever know where your next customers are coming from. And unless you have uh, more money than you know what to do with, um, you don't want to turn away potential customers. Simple as that. So in terms of some of the stuff that you've been working on recently, <laughs> like the tools, uh, like how does a designer think in this way? How does a designer think in terms of standards? Because we just create things in Sketch. We're not thinking about performance. Now, accessibility is only really a new thing that designers are really considering. Uh, and just the tools not necessarily ready there to educate them. Because um, I know you're working on something called Stylable. Stylable is uh, a way of extending CSS because what we found with the uh, as websites get more and more app like and I don't like to use a sort of um, a particular distinction between a site and an app because I think it's a spectrum but as we get more and more sophisticated sites we're tending to use many more um, components based me methodologies whether that's react or angular or web components and the challenge has been uh, to impose unified styling on those. And we're at this kind of weird position with CSS that we've just finally got 
really good tools for design with things like Flexbox and CSS Grid and CSS Shapes and all the filters and the masks. And yet we're seeing lots and lots of, uh, uh, of companies moving away from CSS and, and doing it in JavaScript simply because it, it's easier to encapsulate the CSS to the component and put that in the tool chain. And I think that's a great shame because you hire a great designer um, and great designers are hard to find and you, you've got one and their language they use to express their designs is CSS because nobody designs in Photoshop anymore. And then, then we ask them to learn something else, some kind of weird JavaScript Franken syntax to express their designs that way. You know, it, it seems to me a counterproductive to hire somebody as an expert and then require them to change the way they work and also discourteous you know can you can you change the way you work to fit in with our weird tool chain where we're expressing css in javascript is is a wrong thing to do and anybody who thinks that it's fine well i invite you to leave your copy of vs code open and let the designers change all the fonts and the color schemes and see how that boosts your productivity. So Stylable is a way of extending CSS, but keeping within CSS syntax and rules, so all of your code hinting, code completion, etc., still works, and your tool chain still work. But we extend it within the existing syntax rules so that you can guarantee your styles are scoped to a component, but also so you can style components from the outside um, we, we allow you to override some rules, but not others. So you can change borders and colors, for example, but not change display in line because that would break the component. Um, it's been developed in-house by Wix, and we're currently moving the 110 million Wix websites that already exist to use Stylable because it's more performant. But um, when they asked me to help design the API, I said, well, I'd like to help, but can we make the product open source? And, yeah. and they said, duh, yes, of course. So I thought, great, if it's going to be BSD licensed so everybody can use it, count me in. And they hurl lots of money at me to um, do good for the community. So that's a win-win. Sometimes it feels like we, the, we design our experiences based on the tools that we're using rather than based on what's necessarily best for the user. So it's like the reason why WordPress is so successful because it was so easy for the developer mm -hmm. to produce. The reason why jQuery was so successful was because JavaScript at that point in time was so, like for me as a designer, I, I just didn't make sense that you'd have to do all these separate use cases for browsers. Um, do you think the same thing with some of these like libraries still exist? Is that why we gravitate towards them? And what's the kind of dangers of doing so? I don't know that there's a, a particular technological danger per se. Um, it, again, it comes to fashion, like with browsers, you know, people say jQuery is over. It's not, and there's gazillions of websites happily using jQuery still. But the zeitgeist has moved towards things like React. And I think the biggest danger is that people become experts in a particular tool. And then you ask them to do some vanilla JavaScript programming and they're floundering. Uh, I'm the opposite way. I, I, I can write the vanilla stuff and then I get confused by the tool chain. You know, for me, every time I have to reinstall Node and Webpack and this and that and Babel, it, it, a little bit of me dies inside because I don't know what's going on on my machine anymore. And there's this elaborate uh, system of dependencies. And because I used to be an assembler programmer back in the late 80s, I'm sort of a control freak with my machine and there's all this stuff going on. And if I don't, if anything, part of it breaks, I'm completely at a loss to fix it. So do you think there's a, a degree of ethics that our industry is missing? Yes, I think that people should always think about the end user. The challenge, of course, is the end user is probably, well, is certainly not you uh, with your brand new uh, Pro, MacBook Pro, with your uh, Pixel Phone 2, for example, and super fast broadband. But it's, you know, it's just human nature to assume that the world exists as you see it. Uh, you just have to be more empathetic. Likewise with, with accessibility. I was looking at a site the other day with tiny, tiny font in a light grey on a white background. I mean, I wear specs, but I'm not visually impaired, mm. but I couldn't read it because I'm 
halfway to 100 years old, and so my eyesight's degenerating. And everybody's going to get old, so you're designing for your own future and not some mysterious disabled person who you don't know. Just be good. Do you think these tools are damaging the open web, this idea that uh, it's accessible for everyone? Because it does sometimes feel that when we hide things in these tools um, for quick fixes, it's like caffeine, it's great to help you be alert, but the long-term effect can be quite damaging, but we don't really think about the long-term effect. If you'd asked me this five years ago, I'd have said, yes, it is damaging the open web, but I think, like everything else, it, it's more nuanced than that. <clears throat> People, developers and designers, quite rightly, always push the boundaries of what, what's possible. And we saw that with Flash. And it, 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 it's fashionable, it has been fashionable to, to mock Flash, but as you'll remember, when the end of Flash was announced, I wrote a blog post thanking all the Flash developers yeah. because they pushed the web forward and arguably they were damaging the open web. But those of us who advocated for the open web, it was a kick up the arse for those of us who made the standards to make better standards that actually allow people to do what they wanted to do. HTML5 only came, came about because those of us in Opera and Google and Firefox who kicked it off were terrified of Flash and Silverlight. If Flash hadn't pushed us forward, I don't know the web would have, would have advanced as far as it is today. So, yeah, there's always a risk that those who are really pushing the boundaries are giving the open web a challenge, but those of us who advocate and push for the open web have to rise to meet that challenge and then we make it broader and people push the boundaries and thus evolution happens. And would you hold for the future? I think that we're going to see um, whether or not I've retired by the time we see it, but in the next 10, 20 years, people are going to have to wake up to the fact that the majority of their new customer base are not coming from Silicon Valley, not coming from Europe, but are coming from emerging economies, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Nigeria. There's a very young demographic and the people there are rapidly becoming more and more middle class with a greater disposable income. These are places who see themselves as world citizens rather than national citizens who are looking to buy goods and services and experiences from outside their nations. This is where your customers are coming from. And if your website doesn't work for somebody on a low range Android in Indonesia or Nigeria, your competitor's website will. <laughs> you get to the point where you're like dreaming about coding. So <laughs> thinking about all the videos you've been watching and hearing like the theme tunes of different videos in your head, like, so you li you're living and breathing it. So it's like a lot easier for those aha moments to happen. 